All right, today we're speaking with Lizzie Traband, and this girl has such a lineup of, of uh, accolades. I, I, I can't even, I go on and on. We wouldn't be able to get through if I, if I mentioned all of them. But um, Lizzie, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Um, Lizzie is, is uh, just accomplished in dressage, hunters, and jumpers, and a lot more. So we're going to have a little conversation with you today. And on top of it all, this girl has done it all. Um, really, I don't want to say, you know, with, I want to say with, with not both hands. Let's put it that way, you know. <laughs> I know. How do I say it, Lizzie? What's the best way to say it? So, oh, well, well, first off, thank you guys so much for having me. It's really <laughs> a pleasure to be here. But yes, I think it would be wonderful to say with, with one hand because I think it implies you have hand. something more than maybe other people don't, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. Ah, yes. So, um, you have, uh, started uh from the very beginning with on a, your farm i take it with your mother is i i was reading she's had articles inside like magazines and other magazines as well but you got started in your horses from the beginning with at your mother's farm your parents farm however i just want to go ahead and tell us about that yes i i grew up um, on our family's farm. My mom, at a very young age, my grandmother tells stories of when she was a child, how she said, when she's older, she's going to have a farm and they're gonna, there's going to be horses. And my mom worked really hard to make that happen. And I was the lucky kid that got to grow up <laughs> on that farm that we still live on today. Aww. So I certainly, you know, most of my childhood, I just remember being around horses in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And I will say, um, my mom had an, a tremendous impact on, I guess, my character and personality at a very young age. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not an easy task, always raising a kid with a difference or a disability, especially one that is so easy to see as mine. But my mom was very straightforward from the beginning that Aww. I was going to do everything, whether it's chores or unloading hay or riding, and none of Aww. it was going to be a big deal. And it really, um, it helped give me the confidence that I would be able to do whatever I put my mind to, um, which was a really awesome environment to grow up in. Yes, very much so. And I, I know you, you, you started with, was it riding the ponies, the little pony, you had a little pony? I yes. did. I did. Yes. Uh, most of my childhood was centered around a pony named Toby. Yes. <laughs> Toby was an $800 cart pony, oh. cart attack and all, need I say. And <laughs> the story of Toby is my, my mom and dad were driving home from picking up um, a horse trailer, which was a really big purchase at the time. And my mom, you know, or my dad actually woke up my mom. She was sleeping in the passenger seat and said, Oh, look, honey, like there's a horse auction. And, you know, I don't know why my dad did that, but <laughs> uh, needless to say, we came home with Toby on the trailer and he was a very special pony in the sense that he had a lot of character and he, he didn't always do everything I wanted him to do, but he taught me a lot. And I think the biggest thing that he taught me was that not every horse is meant to do what we think it's meant to do. You know, mm -hmm. we always envisioned Toby to be like a pony hunter. He was fancy <laughs> and he jumped cute, but Toby definitely had other ideas. And Aww. I oftentimes found myself going over the jumps without Toby than on Toby. <laughs> so as a kid, I kind of redirected his path and we turned out he really likes tricks and he really liked performing and he really liked being ridden bareback and bridalist <laughs> and um you know we got to go do all these really cool things definitely Aww. because of him <laughs> aren't the ponies quite they're little characters aren't they and they teach you so much yeah. i know so many people that started with oh, ponies so much and, yeah and they teach you a lot and and little toby was so popular, so, so, you know, loved. I mean, he became a little buyer pony too. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Am I right with that? Yeah. He did. That he did. We, we still have, um, I don't, I don't remember how old I was, but yeah, I wrote, I, I got my scissors and my arts and crafts and all my markers out and I made a, a, <laughs> um, a letter to 
to Briar on Aww. why Toby should be a Briar model. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. And it was like craziest thing when the phone rang like Aww. two months later, like, oh, we, we would really like to make Toby a Briar. It was one of the <laughs> coolest moments as a kid. Um, and then on top of that, getting to go to Briar Fest and actually yes. be there because every year they bring like all the new horses and in yes. Kentucky. And that was just like a very, very cool experience Dream on top of Toby true. becoming a briar. Oh, that's really <laughs> sweet. That's a cute story. So yeah. it just, you just kind of progressed from there. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, where that after that then too, I mean, not after Toby, just as it progressed into what you're doing. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting story. I, as a kid, I really did not like competing. I thought horse showing was silly. I thought it was intense. I, I wasn't that committed to like training and the preparation of it. I thought the trick riding and the bridalist and the performing was way more fun. And mm. my mom mm. was really nice in the fact that she was so she was okay with that. There was wow. no pressure to compete. I think actually she was hoping maybe I would do horses just as a wow. fun hobby, not as a profession. Um, <laughs> but as that progressed, I, I remember specifically we got an invitation to perform at the 2010 World Equestrian Games in Kentucky. Yes. Mm -hmm. And with our credentials, we were allowed to go watch a lot of the competitions. Mm -hmm. And we got to go watch the show jumping. We watched all days, all the days. And uh -uh. <laughs> I just remember being, I was 12 years old. I remember sitting in that stadium and being, that's what I want to do. Wow. <laughs> it was like, wow. I have no idea what switched but it was like distinctively in that moment that i was like okay that's what we're gonna do like that's the next thing and um honest to goodness like something flipped in my brain and wow. i got way more serious um i i everything just went in a different direction and kind of never looked back so did your did your mother did you were did she jump did how did i mean that's just all of a sudden boom there you go i mean had you been around yeah. all of that or okay. she did she was a hunter jumper okay. she had a lot of hunters and a small hunter breeding program so that was her okay. background like the more competitive mm. side of it the hunters yeah. and the jumpers um mm, wow. so it was for sure her background fortunately uh. I would say more focused on the hunters, and I was very quickly attracted to the jumpers. Um, mm -hmm. But she was very adamant in the beginning that I get the foundation in the hunter ring, which I think is a really great uh, system that we have here in America. So I didn't transition into the jumpers until I was about 15 or 16. But you had already done bridalists and tricks and all kinds of things with, with, yeah, with, yeah, with your little yeah. Toby, right? It's <laughs> so it's really fun. That's cute. And I Aww. didn't like, I have, I have a lot of appreciation for it now that I'm older, but I think yeah. like growing up, you're so young, trick, you're so young, Yeah, <laughs> doing the tricks and the bridalists, like it taught me a lot of different skills that I don't know. I think maybe they're not honed in on as much when you're sure. riding with the saddle and with the bridle like you yeah. did a lot of vaulting and trick riding and there's so much balance and feeling yes. that goes into that mm -hmm. we were just doing it for fun but i really think yeah. it was a blessing in disguise i i mm -hmm. couldn't agree with you more yes and it yeah. certainly has proven to be that so yep <laughs> so so from there then you did you go right into the jumpers then or how did that go for you then well that would have been really amazing but unfortunately um <laughs> There is this, I guess, it's not so easy in our industry, depending yeah. on what resources you have available. Yes. I mean, I'm sure you guys know it's horses in general are very expensive yes. just to care for and train and everything. But the it was definitely um, there were limitations in terms of what resources we had available as a family. I mean, mm -hmm. it was incredible that we had a farm so we mm -hmm. could afford to keep a horse. But going out and spending money on a horse yes. and then also figuring out how to pay for the shows and mm -hmm. all of that we had to be very creative so a hundred percent if we had an unlimited bank account i would yeah. have probably loved to have jumped in <laughs> uh, more aggressively than we did but we we had to get creative and uh, again I, I think it was a blessing in disguise i was uh, a working student uh. for a lot of different professionals um I really, the our federation, the USHJA, has a ton of grants and education opportunities, and I took advantage of those as much as I possibly could, which it just like one thing led to the next, uh -huh. um, and each door kind of kept opening. Uh -huh. So it, it wasn't as, I guess, fast as I would have loved as 12-year-old me, but eventually we, you know, 
got to where we wanted to go. So and we're still working on it <laughs> to this Aww. day. But those open doors are just confirmation, aren't they? That you're going in the right yeah. direction, you know? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful how it happens that way? You know, just so, so good. Aww. This podcast is brought to you by Ram Fence and Stalls, the one-stop shop for your horse farm. Ram is family-owned and operated and been in business for over 30 years. We welcome you to call in and speak with an expert about your next project today at 866-653-8984. Again, that's 866-653-8984. So you have done so much. I mean, so many different shows. And, and um, you know, you, you had like a, to me, a career. Um, and, and you do have your own business as well. But um, tell us some of the, the shows, the larger shows and things that you have been involved in and what you've done. Oh, oh my goodness. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough question. I, it's interesting because I, I actually, as a junior, did not show, I think, as, as much as most people thought I showed. And I still to this day, I can say that I've, like, I've never done indoors. Okay. Uh, which are very big, like four shows that we have in the fall. I've also never shown at Devon Springs. Like, I still have a lot of big boxes I'd really like to check. Mm -hmm. I'd say, like, a couple ones that really stick out to me uh, or I, are dear to my heart um, was I did get to go to Junior Hunter Finals as a junior. I got to go two years in a row. But mm -hmm. the thing that was more special than that was I went on a horse that I had bought as a yearling with the money I had earned from Briarfest. So Aww. I got a small chunk of change from Briarfest. My mom said, if you want to do the junior hunters, you better buy a young horse and make it up. And we did. And it was a miracle that he was such a good boy. And he really like was that saintly that a kid could bring him along. Mm -hmm. And that is the horse I showed at junior hunter finals two years in a row. And he was very competitive. And I mean, it was, he got ribbons. That was like very, very cool. Um, it meant a lot more than if we had been in a position to buy a made horse, for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. For sure. So that yeah. one's very memorable. I'd say the other one, this was a, a little detour I took when I was 16. I was struggling to find a jumper to jump some bigger heights, and I was really itching to, like, improve my riding. I felt like I kind of hit a wall at that age. It's also mm -hmm. when I got the prosthetic. Mm -hmm. So I took a break and did dressage. And a really awesome opportunity came along to get to ride a pretty well-educated horse. Mm -hmm. And I made the selection trials for France. And we got to go to Gladstone in wow. New Jersey for the selection mm -hmm. trials. And that was, like, pretty surreal, yes. too. We didn't yeah. make the team. We were not ready to go to, oh. <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to, I think it was London was that year. Um, or Normandy, Normandy. But... It was like such a cool experience. Like that's wonderful. Me, it's like wow, I can't believe we're we're here. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine so, that would have been incredible. Really yeah, incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. It was incredible, oh. and it's like it's definitely some silver lining because again, you know, six nine months prior to that, I was just kind of in hitting a wall, like frustrated with my riding, not yes. sure how I was going to take the next step, like. So I just kept knocking on every door I could find. Uh, 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 <laughs> sure enough, uh, one of them worked out. Persistence. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There you go. Aw. Well, let me just, if I if I could mention this, you know, maybe you could speak a little bit to people. Um, I I just, you know, I don't like to call it like even a disability because you've just what you've done is you've just taken it and it's not you know what I'm saying but is there anything that you would want to you know talk a little bit about some of the things that you've had to go through or that might be encouraging to other people that are like I can't do this I don't know if I can you know and give a little um you know uh, a bit of what you feel with that yeah definitely um I I definitely believe that your mental state and how you mentally view whatever disability or challenging you're facing has yes. an incredible impact whether or not you overcome it or get over it or, or however you want to phrase that mm -hmm. that being said i would also say that what comes from like your mental well-being and and mindset is the environment that you're around yeah. and i think it's incredibly difficult if you're in an environment or around people that deep down don't believe that you can do something mm -hmm. because there is this underlying energy 
that you kind of you 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 also as a person think oh maybe i can't do this yeah and that is like you're done <laughs> and yeah. that's the the kind of energy and underlying tone i hope i'm explaining this correctly you are yeah no it's understandable yeah mm -hmm. yeah right understand my my mom was a really incredible like figure as a child because we'd hit a wall and she'd be like okay like just gonna take a breath and we'd go back and yes. like we'd work on it at home or like we'd hit a wall okay we're just gonna like take a break and we'd go back and work on it at home like it was never a big deal but for Aww. sure like I'm not saying that it was easy, but it was never a big deal. And mm -hmm. we just kept working on it and kept working through it. And like the patience and the, the yes. calmness and the system, it all kind of comes together in the end. So I think that's really important that the people around you also believe in yourself, yes. not to mention that you also have to believe in yourself. Um, and the last thing I would add to that is it's very important, even for full functioning bodies <laughs> yes. to understand that your journey or your progression is never going to be the same as the person sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. So it's like the comparison and this yes. and that, like you just, you really have to kind of focus in, take a deep breath and say, you know, this is my journey and it's going to be unique. And we might go upside down, backwards, left, right, and a million other circles before we like go in the direction we want, but that's totally okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you don't enjoy that aspect of it, we also have a problem. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it, it sounds so um, good. Like you and your mother, it sounds like have such a good relationship and she just was patient, but then she also was not support. She was supportive, not pushing, but just we'll take a break. We'll get back to it. And it's that mm -hmm. going back to it, I think, saying, oh, it's okay, you know, chalk this one up for experience, we'll give it a yeah. break, and we'll keep on going, right? And that's, yeah. 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 My dad very much so, like, um, is this kind of same way. Like, he always tells me, even to this day as an adult, because I, I am very hard on myself, Aww. he'll always say, um, experience is the thing you need right after you get it. Like, yes. you always learn the most right after yeah. you've made the mistake. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Because, you know, we, a lot of people in this industry are type A. We don't like to make mistakes. We don't like to do it wrong. We want to do it right. But you 100% learn the most when you, you know, have an absolute disaster or a huge mistake. <laughs> like, um, it's the yeah. best learning experience. <laughs> and then you never do it again when you do it wrong. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, no, it's well, really important for sure. In the beginning, I, I know you talked about you, you come off many times and I'm not trying to you know, say, remember all those I'm times sorry, you felt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, yeah. people need to realize and understand, and you were young, which is good. You wouldn't want to do it at my age, you know what I mean? But I'm just saying, and I've done it. I've you come were still off many bouncing times. at yeah. that, you yeah. know? Done it, been there, you know what it's like. But the thing is, is that, you know, getting back on and going, I think is sometimes the hardest thing when you get discouraged, no matter what you have that you're up against, whether, you know, it's a disability or whether it's just trying to learn how to do something, but you kept at it and, um, you know, really shown that it really pays off and, and does a lot. So it's amazing you're still on your same farm. That's that's awesome Thank too, you. isn't it? The history yeah, that's there. Yeah, yeah, it's our pride and joy. I bet. <laughs> I love bet. It. A lot of mowing and a lot of weed whacking. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. Made, like taking care of a farm. <laughs> exactly. We love it. Is there yeah. anything that you'd like to tell like our listeners about what you've done that would be, you know, I know you talked about like the kind of the aspect or the side of, um, you know, just keep going. Is there anything else that you'd like to say or speak out to people about that you've learned? You've said a lot, but <laughs> anything else that rings true with you that you feel, hey, you know, know this, this is a big help. I think those are the two big ones. I mean, mindset, uh, environment, people that are around you and not being afraid to have a unique journey. I think that those are really important. The, one of the coolest things about the horse world is you can go in so many di different directions mm -hmm. and it's amazing like how much you can learn from a different community within our big community. Yes. You know, like I remember too, some of the things we used to, to use, some of the tools and the training activities and we used to use back in the trick riding days and the performing days have 
kind of also carried over to some of our performance yeah. horses now like it's i think it's really important that um we don't forget that just because you're like a hunter jumper person doesn't mean yeah. that's the only world that exists in the yes. horse world and yes. if you are like hitting a wall or need a break like take a step back and maybe explore some other things because the community as a whole it's amazing it is um, how diverse it is and how many different directions you can go very much so. It's very faceted, very faceted. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit now, <clears throat> excuse me, about what you're doing in your business that you have and, and what you're doing that way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so basically where my energy is focused now is I have a small string of horses, so no more than 10. And we take horses or I ride horses for the owners and clients and we also have some partners and mm -hmm. generally speaking when the horses come into the program they're maybe a young jumper ages five six or seven so they're already started they're already under saddle they've already been introduced to the sport and then what we do or what I do is I try to produce those horses through the levels and we either when they hit a certain point where we've decided they're scoping out or they've mm -hmm. reached their comfort zone, mm -hmm. we sell them to like a good riding amateur or, um, you know, into the correct situation. Or hopefully if they're, they do have the quality and the talent and all the right ingredients to continue up the top levels of the sport, we continue their development. Um, so it's kind of a niche thing. And the fact that I, I recognize I'm, I'm not sure how sustainable or if I want to go down the path or lifestyle of being like a top, top international rider, mm -hmm. because when you're a top, top international rider, the travel is a lot. It's very intense. Um, you have to be, have a full string of horses. Yes. The focus has to be on competing, yes. which is really important, like for the team riders and all that. It's very, very important. But what I really love love about what I do is it's the horses at an earlier stage in their life where we're really focused on the horses and we're really focused on producing them mm -hmm. and developing them mm -hmm. and like the competing is almost the reward if that makes sense we do compete yes. a lot I mean we're in Florida in the winter we travel a lot in the summer but like my job okay. is to really like teach the horses <laughs> if that yes. makes sense so yes. it's a really fun thing to do and it's my business is quite young so this has been a really exciting year because I have for the first time like two nine-year-olds that are moving into the Grand Prix, which is really cool. Wow. And I've also seen a few horses that I've leased or sold that are mm -hmm. out there with their other situations that are doing really well. So it's still very young, um, nice. but it's been really fun. And I'm just so lucky that people actually like pay me to ride their horses because that's just like yes. so cool. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh. Yeah, so that's the business now. That's the main focus of the bread and butter. I still do teach a little bit on the side. I have a few riding clients, but again, you know, with all due respect to them, they understand that my focus has to be on the that string of 10 horses mm -hmm. um, because I do really believe if you're going to do something, if you're going to do something well, you have to be focused on what you're doing. Yes. So I pride myself on that. You know, it's what I tell my clients and that is 100% true. It's myself and it's mm -hmm. one other girl and we're hands on with the horses every day. We know them probably too well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's really great because I, I do really believe that we get the best out of them. And then we work really hard to get them either continue their development or get them into the right situation, mm -hmm. uh, which is also really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really cool that you are putting a lot of emphasis too on like a smaller string of horses because I feel like like especially when I feel like maybe some of the the younger trainers fall into the trap almost of like getting a little bit of like getting some clientele and then taking on way too much or like just what they can't handle and then you've got horses that are pushed to the side and then maybe mm -hmm. you're missing talent along the way. So I think mm -hmm. it's cool that you're you're focusing on just a few and then really being able to devote your your time to them i think that's mm -hmm. it's a cool mindset yeah. to have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think it's really important for sure I, i'm not gonna lie it's in the beginning especially it was really hard i Aww. had to learn how to say no um, mm -hmm. which is not easy um but it's it's really true and the other part of it too we should talk about is making sure that you're working with people and riding for owners and partners that have the same values as yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I can honestly say that anybody that I have a horse in the barn from, like if something bad happens or if I get on them and I'm worried that 
they don't feel quite right or something's up, I have no hesitation of picking up the phone and calling them. Like those people truly want their horses to be in a good program where we really put the horses first. We really care about them and we want them to do their job and feel good about their job. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sounds crazy, but in a world with there's you know so much money involved with some of these high performance horses, mm -hmm. I, I'm not confident that every program truly puts the horses first. Yeah. So again, like, it's difficult to say no, and it's sometimes hard to be that upfront sure. with people, but it has yes. started to really pay off. Wow. Yeah, that definitely yeah. sets you mm -hmm. up. I mean, learning that lesson mm -hmm. now and kind of making like a boundary part of your program, I think is only going to set you up for success because, mm -hmm. you know, plenty of people learn that way later. So mm -hmm. it's hard yeah. now, but <laughs> you've got it out of the way now. Right. <laughs> but then yeah, you turn out good horses and it makes you successful and the people realize and see that. And the more people that are out there, though, it's slower, but that people see that, then they recognize that and realize how good it is, you know, because you just can't do it fast sometimes and it has to be right. And like you said, it's that difficult so to do true. that. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm always fascinated by that topic because it's, a, it's oftentimes a big topic of discussion right now. We have the young jumper classes, which mm -hmm. are eight they're by the age so five six and seven year olds mm -hmm. and the height is the same like the five-year-olds are supposed to jump one height the six-year-olds are supposed to jump one height and the seven-year-olds are supposed to jump one height well some six-year-olds should not be jumping the six-year-old height yes. i mean it's truly wherever they are in their progression and their development yeah um and I, I try to explain to people like the horses don't know that they're six Right, like, right, right. We know that like this job is easy or this is really scary and I don't yes. want to do this. <laughs> like, yes. So I, I do think it's really important like not to take that for granted. Um, and, and also the same with people like each horse has their own progression. Some get, you know, catch on really fast. Some catch on really fast and then they have to take a step back. Yeah. Um, some just need to catch their breath and need to, you know, have some downtime yeah. or or have a little reset period. Yeah. Um, and it's really important to pay attention to that. And I, I would also switch then to the older horses where we mm -hmm. talk about the seven, eight, nine year olds where they're really settling into their job. Like then we talk about keeping them motivated, keeping them interested. Yes. You know, yeah. we, we hack our horses out in the field. We, we do trot sets uh, in the jump field. You know, we try to really mix it up and keep them happy in their work. Like yes. we don't just drill them in the ring every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, so it's all like really important parts of the program as a whole, yeah. not just the riding and the training. Boy, mm -hmm. There's a lot to it. And I don't think people realize sometimes. <laughs> and, and again, going back to the person, the owner, making sure that they understand that, you know, because some people have their their wants and their desires of what they feel this horse can and should do. Yeah, and I feel like and, the money is such a big, especially with young horse classes, and I'm I'm in the Rainers, so like the young horse yeah, thing, where, yeah. where all of the money is in the young horses, like mm -hmm. I feel like it's really, it can be really hard as an owner to, mm -hmm. and I, I do want to say though that I think that um, almost every owner I've ever met really does care about the horse too, you know, yeah. but it's easy to get caught up in the money and you're like, oh, my horse is talented enough to do this, so therefore it should go do it, but sometimes... Mentally, yeah. they can't, or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, and just mm -hmm. yeah. perspective. No. No. Well, true. you are a hard little worker. You get a lot that you do. So, <laughs> so, so, we, <laughs> well, so, parents would not erase me any other way. That's actually a funny story about that. When I was in second grade, I had Toby and I got puddles. So, Toby was really, I mean, he was a great pony, but he, he wasn't always the safest and he could mm -hmm. pull some dirty tricks. So my mom <laughs> felt I should have a safe pony to learn on. My dad agreed, but my dad's, you know, contingency or, or you know, his one term to this agreement was that if I was going to have two ponies, I was going to clean my two stalls every day before I went to school. And it's even funnier because we were betting on straw at the time. So my parents had to buy shavings. Because I couldn't lift the straw. It was too heavy for Aww. me. So they, they bought bag shavings so that I could do my own stalls every single day. Oh, I think goodness. until I was in middle school. I mean, <laughs> it's so um, cute. Yeah, it was, it was a very good lesson. If you want two ponies, then it means more work. And that's, right. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. just the way it is. <laughs> you, you've earned your badges for sure. So. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Oh, that's so cute. Good. Well, thank you so much. Let's just take a real short break, and then we'll come back for Canter Banter. Do you have horses and live the equestrian lifestyle? Be sure to check out our blog 
at yourhorsefarm.com. Yourhorsefarm.com is a great equine online resource. So be sure to share with all the horse lovers in your life. And remember, laugh much and ride often. Okay, we're back. And now we will do our segment, Canter Banter. So Lizzie, is there a short a story you'd like to share with us or tell us that might be something that uh, we leave on a really good note today? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, actually, you, you just <laughs> reminded me of this silly little story. Um, when I was a junior and, and showing and traveling, I, we didn't have grooms or, or stable hands. So my mom and my grandmother were like my go-to people. Like they'd help me get to the shows and be organized and all of that. And I got to ride this little jumper named Whiskey Rocks. Oh. And uh, we were in Florida one winter and I kept calling my mom. I was up at the ring or working or doing something. And I, I was calling my mom and I said, mom, I need whiskey. Mom, I really need whiskey. Like the class is about to start. Can you please bring me whiskey? Because that's what we called her in the barn. Yep. And at the time I was training with one of her close friends and um, she immediately called, not, not her, but uh, another trainer there at the ring immediately called my mom because I'm very concerned about your daughter. Like, I don't think, well, I was 13 or 14. Um, oh, gosh. I don't think Wellington is the right oh, community no. for her. You know, it's not o'clock in the morning. She was really she's serious. calling somebody for whiskey. <laughs> Yeah, that was oh, a that pretty was funny moment. Oh, oh it's okay. my! It's just the horse that she's riding. Goodness! Right oh now. my! There you go. What did she? Oh, was she just like? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it funny. was very funny. It's even funnier because my family like hardly ever drinks, so it was <laughs> so out of character for the Traban family. But that's so cute. That was definitely a funny moment. That's sure. cute. Oh, well, that's a good one. That's funny. Well, I'm proud well, about that. Lizzie, thank you so much for mm-hmm. taking time thank with you. us. You've just been a delight. Thank you. And we appreciate it's been a pleasure. Well, we appreciate you sharing um, a little window into your life of what you do. And, um, uh, you know, just look forward to talking to you, you know, also in the future as well and looking at what you're doing. So uh, thank you so much, and we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much for having thank me. Thank you. Uh-huh. We hope you enjoyed our podcast and encourage you to share with all of your equestrian family and friends. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform as well as our YouTube channel and stay up to date on all of our shows. Do you have a topic to discuss or a guest recommendation for our hosts? Email us at podcast at ramfence.com.